Welcome to the Digitally Networked Field course. My name is Mark Peddlety, and I've been using a digitally networked field method to teach a course called Environmental Communication since 2015. Given COVID-19 and similar challenges to the traditional classroom model, university educators might find aspects of this method useful. After explaining what a digitally networked field course is, I will outline some of the techniques and technologies that have been most effective in our digitally networked field course. Every class, instructor, student body, and discipline is different, and the digitally networked field course method would not work for all subject matter and pedagogical purposes. However, I think this way of teaching might be of use to those who either want, or as currently the case, need to get their students out of the classroom. Leading up to 2015, I had taught this course several times and felt like it was time for students to be learning the subject matter in the rich context where environmental communication takes place. In other words, we were proactively drawn out into the world rather than being thrusted out of the classroom. The classroom, as the original economy of scale method of teaching, seemed less useful in the era of digital networking than a virtual classroom, given that students can now go out and we could all collectively make our local parks, backyards, historical resources, and global experts part of a digitally linked virtual learning space. That's what this course is, and here is how we do it. First, let me list the ingredients that go into this particular recipe for a digitally networked classroom. The course began in the age of WebCT, evolved to Moodle, and is now on Canvas. We created professional, studio-based videos and still assign many of them, but have actually found over time that audio podcasts are a more effective, flexible, and interactive medium, both for much of my communication with students as well as their interactive assignments. And the affordance of that medium for such interaction is key. In our course, the Public Lands podcast has become our central focus for student projects, and their assignments build in part to student-produced podcasts based on interviews and independent digital and field-based research. And I would be remiss if I did not mention perennial community partners like Metroblooms that have helped us in every way imaginable to get our students out doing important fieldwork in the community. Of course, written assignments, Canvas announcements, and email are essential as are individual and small group live Zoom, Skype, or Google Meet meetings. Although if I were going to reinforce one thing that reoccurs throughout the literature and in this course, it is the power of asynchronous digital media. One way to take advantage of digital affordances is to use the power of asynchronous media production, communication, work, and learning. For example... Over the years, I've had incredibly talented teaching assistants co-teaching the course, facilitating and grading the discussion forum each week, which is our main way of collecting, interacting with, and assessing students' work with the reading assignments and with the videos, as well as each other's projects. Increasingly, students are producing content for the course through our main assignments. And that is also part of what I call a cascading curriculum, in which students trained in through past courses, as well as through their own targeted development and skills, take part in future courses. Let's look at the most recent and one of the very best examples of that cascading curriculum, Hadley Nellis. Hi, this is Hadley Nellis, associate producer of the Public Lands podcast. I'm a junior majoring in studies in cinema and media culture, as well as communications at the University of Minnesota's College of Liberal Arts. I took the Intro to Audio Production course with Mark last fall and have been working under the auspices of the Liberal Arts Technologies and Innovation Services, or Lattice Grant, to help Mark integrate the Public Lands podcast into the environmental communication course. To start, I made a few model episodes. I made one about the right to roam, one about the Ice Age Trail Alliance, and one about the Santa Fe Conservatory. I made each of these episodes in order to help students in the environmental communication course better understand what's possible. While Mark helped these students with each of the assignments that in the end led to podcast productions, including basic recording techniques, interview skills, and editing technologies. I've also been doing a lot of post-production work, ensuring that the class as a whole can put their best face forward to the world. Working together, we are all making the Public Lands podcast work for this digitally networked field course, and hopefully for our public lands. This is Hadley Nellis, associate producer, wishing everybody a happy and healthy spring. Now back to Mark. Thanks, Hadley. 
Having mentioned the learning platform and podcast, what is the field part of a digitally networked field course? In the case of environmental communication, each student is required to adopt a public land or waterway as their field site and are encouraged to choose one with rich interpretive resources, such as a regional or state park with educational exhibits, art installations, interpretive talks, and events. Although right now, during COVID-19, the human dimension has admittedly been diminished. For example, students are required to attend live public events where the subject matter comes alive such as ranger talks or legislative debates. So we have further emphasized creative projects and physical, static, interpretive resources to make up for the loss of such public events. However, you can imagine how useful it has been to forego the classroom on campus for sake of using such events and physical resources and sites as our new classroom. During COVID-19, things continue to pace as students were able to still visit outdoor spaces carefully following state-mandated protocols for safety. And many others could use their backyards and more intimate domestic spaces as their field sites. Our digitally networked classroom has remained rich and robust despite the campus closure. For those that would like to know more about the techniques, technologies, and assignments involved in the course, and digitally networked field classes more generally, feel free to contact me at penalty at umn.edu. And visit the organizations and resources, including the Center for Educational Innovation, that helped me develop this course and can also assist you in creating a digitally networked field course. Meanwhile, I hope that this video has helped you think of ways that a digitally networked classroom might work for your students, especially if the traditional classroom or more conventional online learning do not meet all of your teaching and learning needs. It's certainly not for everyone. For one thing, it becomes harder to segment teaching into discrete time slots throughout the week and weekend. Although those forced into digital instruction by COVID-19 or other circumstances might already be experiencing that change in workflow, it seems as if one is always teaching. On the other hand, like my students, I tend to find teaching digitally, and especially when doing so in our beautiful public lands, far more rewarding than being confined to a classroom where we have to rely solely on our imaginations to think, talk, and learn about such spaces. What's more, making public spaces our collective classroom and doing so in the service of helping to steward our public lands through class learning projects helps us to fulfill and advance University of Minnesota's public land grant mission. Again, much of this might be idiosyncratic to field-oriented classes, but the increasingly powerful affordances of digital technologies and platforms, if used intentionally, can make getting out of the classroom a very good thing.